When I uh, was told of the idea of this conference, I welcomed the conference uh, on small business and entrepreneurship um, because in that title, um, I saw the opportunity uh, for the meeting to address uh, two somewhat distinct but interrelated or overlapping claims. First, uh, in low and moderate income communities, small businesses anchor neighborhoods and generate positive social benefits. And then second, we frequently hear that small businesses account for a great deal of private sector employment and new jobs. Now, I've been thinking quite a lot uh, recently about the jobs crisis in the country and uh, the, the, the jobs crisis that the country is experiencing and the role of small business in a solution. In my time this morning, I'd like to take a look at the connection between small businesses and job creation. That, that is the second of the two claims. In that regard, we also hear often that uh, the small business sector doesn't have enough access to capital, and if only the banks would lend more money, jobs would be created. I'd like to look more deeply into this assertion and try to understand the underlying commercial reality. So my topic this morning is small business, job creation, and bank financing. As Todd mentioned, I'm a former banker. So I think I might add some value to the conference by going into some de depth on the subject of how banks actually lend to small businesses with a particular focus on startups. It's axiomatic that almost all startups are small businesses. It turns out that research shows, uh, as regards job creation, it's uh, new businesses that make the most difference in creating jobs, rather than small businesses broadly defined. The Kauffman Foundation uh, supported, this, uh, supported research that came to this conclusion, and I believe the point was made by Carl Schramm yesterday in his uh, passionate call for more startups. So to narrow the focus of my remarks this morning even further, uh, my topic is startups, job creation, and bank financing. Now let me put startups, or new business formation, in the full context of, small, of the small business sector. The small business sector, and this point was made by my colleague John Robertson, is extremely heterogeneous. Among the conventional criteria for classifying a business as small are number of employees, revenues, assets, numbers of, a number of establishments, and sometimes legal structure. Unfortunately, no single metric provides a definition that's uh, adequate for all purposes. I'm told that a report to Congress in the 1970s cited over 700 different possible definitions of small business. The most commonly applied metric, as you heard yesterday, is number of employees with cuts at 500 or fewer or, and 50 or fewer. I know many of you are quite familiar with the following picture, but let me quickly review some high-level information. On an employment basis, the vast majority of business enterprises in the United States are small, even far smaller than 50. According to the 2008 statistics of uh, U.S. businesses, there are about 21 million non-employer businesses in the country. Most are self-employed individuals operating very small unincorporated businesses which may or may not be the owner's principal source of income. These are important sources of employment for the owners, but clearly are not strong creators of jobs for others. Of the slightly less than 6 million businesses that have paid employees, almost 80% have fewer than 10 employees. So back to categorization. For the purpose of talking about startups, and their impact on job creation, let me suggest a more qualitative categorization. 
I think we can put new businesses into two buckets, scalable growth businesses versus inherently small scale firms. The former, that is scalable growth businesses, have re been referred to in a Kauffman Foundation study as gazelles. And again, you heard that term yesterday. The latter, uh, the inherently small scale businesses, are sometimes called mom and pops. Inherently small scale firms often populate highly fragmented industries like res restaurants, dry cleaners, boutique retail stores, and beauty salons. Occasionally, one of these inherently small-scale businesses surprises even the owner by growing beyond expectations. And occasionally, the business concept is unique enough to be franchised and thereby grow to substantial scale. Every once in a while, a burger joint in San Bernardino, California, becomes McDonald's. But mostly, the business people who launch these small-scale enterprises start with the intention of remaining relatively small. In contrast, the entre entrepreneurs behind scalable growth businesses hope their companies will become large. They may expect that success will bring the opportunity to go public or to sell to a larger company. Within the category of small business startups, Scalable startups and scaling young businesses are a driver of job creation. Again, this point was made yesterday. What makes them scalable is that these new businesses address large potential markets, offer products and services with positive scale economies, and or have a business model that's replicable. Of course, many intended scalable growth businesses fizzle out and fail. The DeLorean Motor Company, which was intended to rival the bigger auto firms, quickly and spectacularly disappeared. Interestingly, the name has been resurrected recently by an entirely different company in Houston, Texas. All this points up the tremendous churn of new business formation, failure, and disappearance. In a dynamic economy like the United States, businesses start and cease operations all the time for any number of reasons. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau show that the rate of establishment formation, and I'll use this as a proxy for business formation, averaged about 12 percent a year over the period 1992 to 2005. Exit rates averaged about two percentage points lower, or 10 percent, over this period. So the total number of establishments over that period grew over time. A closer look at mortality shows that about 20 percent of establishments failed in their first year, and about half failed within the first five years. Now, the data are not perfect. We heard a call yesterday from Alicia Robb for uh, more and better data. But I think, they, I think they are reliably suggestive of an economy that is constantly and vigorously creating new businesses and jobs, while at the same time destroying other businesses and jobs. And it's the balance of these that makes for positive or discouraging labor market conditions. Without a continuous flow of new business formation, the U.S. economy would, would be always shedding jobs. And further, many of the jobs that are created by business startups are impermanent because of the high failure rate. We know that the rate of business failures grew sharply during the recession. More troubling, though, is that the rate of new business formation fell sharply during the recession and seems to have been very slow to recover. According to data of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number of new establishments uh, decreased from a peak of about 870,000 uh, in the year 2006 to 700,000 in 2009 and 720,000 in 2010. 
So in broad strokes, here's the picture. Virtually all startups are small. Whether so-called mom and pops or gazelles, they create some jobs at inception. Inherently small enterprises either fail or sustain operations, but tend to level off in terms of employment. The growth businesses, the gazelles, ramp up creating initial employment. They may fail in time or they may grow to what is still small scale and level off or they may break out and grow to large scale. A 2010 study by the Kauffman Foundation shows that just 1% of employer businesses, those growing the fastest, generate roughly 40% of new jobs in a given year. Three quarters of those businesses are less than five years old. The takeaway point, in my opinion, is this. If we want to grow jobs, one place we should look is to startups and young businesses, especially scalable growth businesses that often set out to commercialize innovation. Scalable startups need capital. So what is the role of banks in providing startups with needed financial capital? Commercial banks play a significant but not dominant role in startup financing. The information is a little dated, but according to the 2007 survey of business owners con uh, conducted by the Census Bureau, 19% of employer firms said that a business loan from a bank was a source of startup or acquisition capital. 11% cited using credit cards and 8% used home equity loans. Des despite the not insignificant role of banks, it turns out that the most commonly used source of startup financial capital was personal savings, used by 62% of respondent firms in the same survey. In April of this year, my colleague, uh, Federal Reserve Governor Elizabeth Duke, spoke on, the, on small business credit availability. And in her talk, she cited the Federal Reserve's 2010 Survey of Consumer Finances, which, despite that name, had some information on sources of funding to start, acquire, or expand closely held businesses. Referencing this survey, she also pointed out that the most frequently used source of startup finance was personal savings and assets. When a bank does make a loan specifically to finance a startup, the bank, regardless of the size of the bank, rarely backs the business per se or the entrepreneur based on his or her good standing without recourse to what we used to call, or what I called as a banker, a second way out. Banks usually require uh, collateral that represents an independent source of repayment. This typically means collateral unrelated to the business that can be easily liquidated or a guarantor of independent means. The most prevalent form of hard collateral is real property. Startup entre uh, entrepreneurs often hear something like, if you'll put up your house, we'll lend to your new business. Real estate related to the business, to the extent the entrepreneur needs such real estate and actually owns it, in fact can be problematic as collateral because its value may be a function of the business cash flow it helps generate. In such a case, the banker's primary source of repayment and the second way out are not independent of each other. Uh, yesterday, my colleague John Robertson cited some of this information from our own survey, but it appears that banks have pulled back their direct lending to finance business startups in recent years. For example, the Fed's poll of small business credit conditions in the Southeast uh, found that businesses less than six years old were much less likely to have utilized a loan from a bank when they started a business 
versus older firms and uh, more, were much more likely to have used or relied on personal savings. Beyond personal savings, new and young businesses rely on, owners, uh, on the owner's personal credit. Sources of personal credit, personal bank credit for starting a business include, as I said earlier, home equity loans and credit cards. The fall in residential real estate values since 2007 is a plausible explanation for some of the drop-off in new business formation during and since the recession. Budding entrepreneurs have less equity in their homes to back a home equity line of credit. Both credit limits and outstanding balances on home, equi on home equity lines of credit have continued to decline since 2007. According to CoreLogic, at the end of June, almost 23% of residential mortgages with a mortgage were in a negative equity position. And in some locations, that percentage was much higher. Also, personal credit card revolving debt has been a source of startup and early stage financing. Personal credit cards are a form of unsecured credit and are generally granted on the basis of assessments of repayment factors such as personal credit history and income. Again, the bank is not backing the business idea per se. According to the New York Fed's quarterly report, on household debt and credit. Both the number of credit card accounts and account limits have increased modestly in 2011, but they remain well below pre-recession levels as credit card delinquencies remain elevated. Some banks, but I would say a minority of banks, have specialized asset-based lending or ABL units that are able to use the business assets, that is receivables, inventory, and equipment uh, as collateral. But because ABL is a specialized lending business requiring significant infrastructure, in, infrastructure and systems investment, many banks are not geared up to do, th to do this kind of lending. ABL requires detailed and frequent monitoring of collateral positions and specialized expertise. Such lending techniques have histori historically been the province of non-bank finance companies that fund themselves in the wholesale markets and are not depositories, uh, as are banks and credit unions. The wholesale funding model of finance companies came under severe stress during the financial crisis and its aftermath. Many community banks are not able to afford the investment in asset-based lending infrastructure and specialized lending personnel. The econ economics of the ABL business require substantial scale to absorb the cost of intense collateral monitoring. And in any event, business asset-based loans and lines of credit are rarely available to raw startups that are, uh, are not yet proven or established businesses. And this is because predictable and reliable cash flow is always the preferred and happy uh, way that banks get their loans repaid. So the point is banks are not natural financial backers of a new business idea based on the perceived merits of the idea or the assets generated by the business in the very early stages of operation. This has been the reality for quite some time, and I would argue the banking community is uh, behaving consistently with the past. The data showing the incidence of failures among uh, startups reinforces this point, I think. The more reasonable domain of banks is loans of moderate risk to more established businesses that can demonstrate a track record. Because banks make loans using mostly depositors' money, they have, have to be right in their credit decisions virtually all the time. So how then are we to get uh, capital to startups 
and early stage enterprises in the interest of job creation? Uh, what parties are appropriate and geared up to take the risk of startups? Well, as, early, as already mentioned, personal savings and, and money from friends and family have been uh, very important sources of startup financing. In addition, high potential startups also look to venture capital firms and angel financing. Business incubators increasingly play a role of organizers and coordinators of angel networks. A recent development, interestingly, is the use of social media to mobilize startup investment, aggregating small dollar investments. Taking to, taken together, this is not a wholly satisfying answer to the question of where do we get startup financing. Capital formation for scalable startups and early stage businesses, including debt capital, is both a private sector and public policy challenge. The volume of activity is immense. The targets of investment are small. The risk of loss is high. And the market, so to speak, if you can use that term, is atomized, decentralized, and not highly organized. We know the startup sector is important, and it appears it is sputtering. We need more activity in this area of the economy. It's tempting to look at the commercial banking sector as a fix. My message this morning is I think this is too narrow a view. My purpose today was simply to lay out the commercial reality of this challenge. I think a practical grasp of commercial reality, including the role of banks, is a necessary starting point for generating ideas that will be helpful. Thank you very much, and I think we have a couple minutes. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Great, no questions. Or comments, of course. Yes. Yeah, Cheryl Winston Smith from Fox School Business, Temple University. And I'm curious, I think we talked a little bit about this offline, but I'm curious about the role of intellectual property in asset based lending, particularly for scalable high tech startups. Well, the question relates to the role of intellectual property in scalable growth businesses and uh, First, let me say that I'm, I'm not an expert, but often it is uh, some degree of control, if not uh, patented ownership of intellectual property that becomes the basis for uh, a scalable st uh, startup. I, I have to emphasize I haven't really studied this deeply, but um, I certainly heard from reliable sources that uh, some reform uh, and making more efficient of our patent system uh, might be quite helpful in uh, in speeding the uh, the time it takes to get uh, let's say a protectable a protectable position a protected position in in um, intellectual capital uh, in order to to launch a business so you know I think that's a, an idea certainly worth looking at. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, President. Uh, my name is Saurabh Narayan. Uh, I'm uh, running a company called National Community Investment Fund, which is a CDFI, mm -hmm. investing in CDFI banks around the country. Um, I think in your comments you talked about the fact that the traditional role of banks has been to do invest or provide lending to more traditional startups with more sort of predictable cash flow, which is correct. Yeah. We also talked a lot yesterday and, you know, in your comments about partnerships with venture capital funds. There's a burgeoning industry of, you know, community development venture capital funds which are actually helping in promoting, uh, uh, you know, new businesses, startup new businesses, as well as, you know, existing businesses taken from angel state to, you know, growth stage. Uh, you know, promoting enterprises that are helping in significant amount of, you know, community stability as well as job creation. In my mind, you know, there is a role for us bankers and non-bankers to create partnerships such that uh, we provide different kinds of capital, 
both equity capital, startup growth capital, and then traditional bank capital. So what's your sense in, as to how we promote that such that different kinds of capital can go into uh, startup and small businesses? Yeah. Well, I, I agree very much with your, your view that um, creativity and creating categories of capital that uh, have thought out and calibrated the risk reward in that kind of investment. Uh, if we can do more creative work, particularly uh, in the startup space, the, that might be very helpful. I, I'm aware, for example, and you referenced it in your question, that uh, a number of commercial banks that may have withdrawn a little bit from early stage financing are in fact supporting CDFIs, and CDFIs in turn are making if not absolute startup, very early stage loans uh, or, or sometimes investments in, in firms that are uh, helpful to a particular uh, community. Uh, obviously, that's a, from the bank's point of view, that's a second order kind of, of loan or investment. Uh, they're not taking the direct risk. They're taking, in effect, a portfolio risk with the CDFI. Um, and so that's another example of getting second and third order support that, that calibrates the risk for the lender down so that the primary lender uh, can, can have the funds to focus on, uh, I would hope, a very well thought out uh, credit box for, for particular kinds of companies. So partnerships between entities um, that create, you can almost think of this in insurance sense. There's the first loss and the second loss and the third loss, uh, partnerships within entities that can connect first, second, and third loss and have the right position taken by the right institution, I think can go a long way to getting some capital formation in the sector. Great. We're right on time. Thank you very much for your attention.